Hello and welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, this is where we explore the practical science of lasting well-being. And if you've listened to before, welcome back. Our lives are filled with relationships, large and small. And maybe the most important of these is the relationship we have with ourselves. You're the only person you'll be around every minute of every day for the rest of your life. And unfortunately, that relationship is often our most complicated one. We often find it easier to be understanding, kind, accepting, and compassionate toward others than toward ourselves. We might accept ourselves in the same grudging way that we accept the annoying behavior of our friends sometimes, or even love ourselves in a kind of obligatory, yeah, I love them, familial sort of way. But at least in my experience, it's actually kind of rare for people to truly like themselves. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today, becoming a better friend to yourself and learning to like ourselves. To help us do that, I'm joined today by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist and a best-selling author, and I'm also happy to say that he's my dad. So dad, how are you doing today? I'm good and really looking forward to this topic. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good one. It's super rich, um, and it's one that you've done a lot of work on, so I'm excited to talk about it with you. Before we get into the episode, I do have a couple of quick reminders. First, you can, of course, follow us on social media. And then finally, if you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, you can join us on Patreon. We're at patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast, and for just a couple of dollars a month, you can support the show and receive a bunch of bonuses in return, like transcripts of the episodes, expanded show notes, and ad-free versions of all the content that we produce. So I'd like to start the content of this conversation just by getting your take on this as a whole. You, of course, worked as a therapist for many, many years, and you've gotten such an intimate picture of people's internal struggles in this territory. So what do you think about this, Dad? I think it's a great topic, and I think it's really important and really helpful to sort out what we're talking about. Uh, otherwise, it could be kind of a mess when we go down the road of it. And what I mean by that is to sort of sort out, on the one hand, inside people can be a big pile of self-criticism and underlying feelings of inadequacy, worthlessness, brokenness, et cetera. And that can have a can cast a long shadow, uh, can really wear down any sense of accepting oneself and respecting oneself. So there's that's kind of in the mix here. Then there's the weird, what do you mean? I understand what you mean about I like you, but I like me, how can I separate from me to like me? And what does that actually even mean? And is there a stable me to like, let alone a stable I to do the liking, really. And suddenly, <laughs> we're twisted in knots. Not even to get philosophical about it, yeah. but just sort of, well, what do you really, really mean? And I think people throw around these phrases, I like myself, almost like platitudes, but if you really burrow into it, they don't even know what they mean when they use those words. And then there's this element of, are you someone who knows what it is to like anyone? <laughs> That's kind of heavy. Yeah. Do you know what it feels like to like someone? And, or more acutely, do you know what it's, what it's like to find things in others, in beings that are likable? Are you clear about that? That's very important. That's very important that you're able to discern and respond to that which is likable in persons and that you're someone who then, in turn, can mobilize warmth, respect, appreciation, friendliness, fondness. This is what we mean by liking, right? And then last, if you are someone who can discern what's likable, and second, can you mobilize feelings of liking, with regard to yourself, can you do that including in ways that are not hijacked or swamped by other feelings of inadequacy, shame, self-criticism, et cetera. 
that kind of sets the landscape. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I think that those definitely would support somebody in liking themselves more. But it's funny that most people seem to struggle with that, myself included, at various points in my life, right? So um, kind of layered on top of that, why do you think that most people kind of struggle to like themselves so much? Like, what, are, what do you think some of the causal factors are that lead to this lack of self-liking? Yeah, I think it's kind of in sort of what I was getting at, which is, one, a big pile of disliking yourself, let's say, a big pile of self-criticism, feelings of inadequacy, and sometimes uh, appropriate, a sense of shame at having done things that are despicable or not likable, right? So there's that part. And, and a lot of that big pile is way bigger than it deserves to be, really. And, you know, that's something we've really talked about. And then also, I think there's something in us that we hold back needlessly, a sort of I had a teacher to use the phrase, a blessing disposition. He also used the phrase, the mood of complaint. Uh, we get caught up sometimes in a mood of complaint about others. So we're focusing a lot on what we don't like about them. And we can get caught up in a similar mood of complaint toward ourselves. And we can also not be very practiced in or motivated uh, around delivering that blessing disposition finding what is pleasing in others and being willing inside yourself to be pleased by it. We just don't have that going for us very much. And so it's really hard to bring that to ourselves. It's hard enough, we don't bring it to others. Well, if we don't bring it to others, we're gonna to tend not to bring it to ourselves. Um, another piece of it is that I think sometimes people are just not very in touch with some of the things that are really su sweetest and most likable about them. Maybe those things are kind of vulnerable, they're maybe young, they maybe are associated with some dorkishness or embarrassment or awkwardness, like, uh. So we're just, you know, not practiced in that. Mm. And, and then I think a last thing, which is a barrier, and these are all good things to work on, is to actually be a likable person. Not because you're trying to conform to some standard or walk on eggshells around another person, but to live today with your head high in a way that means you can live with your head high today. Deliver the goods, keep your agreements, be a stand-up person, carry your end of the log. Great. I know. I think right on. And I want to spend a little bit of time here talking about some of those kind of key tendencies that people tend to have that tend to get in the way of self-friendship or liking yourself. And then maybe in a little bit, we'll then talk about some specific practices and techniques that people can use in order to build more of a sense of self-liking. Um, but I wanna kind of key in on something you were just saying there in terms around um, appreciating our good qualities. Because I do think that there is this really important and interesting imbalance that you see in people where we get extremely sensitized to our negative qualities, negative behaviors, and negative traits. And yet we manage to habituate to our positive qualities, tendencies, and traits. And if you think about this for a minute, you will immediately know what I mean. There's this really unfair structure that exists inside of the brain where um, every day we're around ourselves. And because of this, it feels like the things that bug us about ourselves start to really bug us, right? We get really sensitized to them. A two on a scale of one to 10 turns into a six or a seven or an eight over time. And then on the other hand, we don't get sensitized to our positive qualities. We just kind of stop noticing them. We stop noticing the ways in which we're a little nicer than most other people, or we're a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more willing to listen, a little bit more willing to give a full effort because that's like the wallpaper of our experience. It's not in the foreground of our awareness. And this is really unfair, right? Your mind is being unfair to you. We get used to all of the good stuff, and then we get sensitized to the parts of ourselves that we dislike. And I think that that's part of, for starters, what's really helpful about having external inputs sometimes, whether that external input is like a good supportive friend group or a therapist, 
You know, it's somebody who can really kind of hold the mirror up to you and say, hey, yeah, there's this thing over here that maybe you have to work on, but man, look at these 12 other things that are pretty great um, because we just get so used to our own experience of the world. Forrest, I think that's one of the most important things you've said oh. in our history of the podcast. Thank you, Seriously. Dad. Uh, it's fresh. It's great. Mm. I've never heard anyone say it. Mm. And it's incredibly consequential. Mm. Uh, one of the, the takeaways for me, at least from that, and I'm going to put this into practice myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a practice guy. Yeah. Uh, is to build in a correction factor. Yeah. In effect, uh, you know, to put it kind of maybe too concretely, but for example, if you find yourself being critical of yourself, and maybe it's legitimate, like, uh, for example, I was supposed to send an email out for mom earlier today, and the address that we were sending it to was kind of strange, and there were three L's in a row in the person's name and uh, or their email address, and I only put two L's in, it didn't go, and so we had about a 12-minute delay of getting it out, and yet it was time urgent, and I was like, er, okay, for every er, <laughs> you have for yourself, you need to offset it with at least three, at least three actual, factual things about yourself that you recognize that are pretty cool and so forth. So I think that's extremely important to take on as a general practice and to make sure that whatever uh, or criticism or correction or guidance we're bringing to ourselves is not full of top spin. It's not exaggerated and overdone. It's just the minimum necessary to get the job done because we're very vulnerable to that sort of stuff. So that's, that's good. Related to that, I think it's very helpful to kind of realize what's the bar that you have for other people to be likable enough? What's the bar you have to look at another person maybe a casual acquaintance, they're down the hall in your apartment building and you you say hello to them at yeah, the I elevator. Yeah, I think they're pretty cool. Yeah, I think they're pretty cool. Or I can see you're basically a, a, a good person. Not perfect, not a saint, but not a sociopath. <laughs> <You know? laughs> not, probably come help me if I need something in the middle of the night. Basically good person. How high is that bar? And then ask yourself, how high is the same bar applied to yourself to be seen as pretty cool? or a basically good person. It's often completely- So high, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So unfair. And to just think about what would it be like to just hold yourself to the same standard that you hold other people to, to be pretty cool, a basically good person, and then to give that to yourself on a regular basis every day. Absolutely right on. I, I wonder if part of this does get back to just social comparison because you were talking about the social dynamic there of like, oh, you see somebody down the hall, you think that they're basically a good person because you're just seeing them in kind of normal presentational ways. You're not connecting with the depths of the underbelly of their subconscious and all of the painful and unfair and horrible material that lies therein, right? And we've talked about this on the podcast so many other times where we often see at the very least kind of like the trimmed up movie of other people's experience, if not the absolute highlight reel of it, while we are suffuse with the painful fullness of our own. And I think that that just leads to a social comparison aspect where it is very challenging for us to win inside of that comparison. Mm. I think that's true. And I, I just found myself thinking a little bit about you know, the id, the deep basement, the swamp in the mind of every one of us, including my own. And I was just reflecting about how we are not aware of the swamp rats <laughs> in, the, in the guy down the hall, thankfully. Okay, we're painfully aware of our own little swamp rats muttering away. Okay, got it. But then the real interesting question is, just like it doesn't really matter to us, the swamp rats and the other person, is it possible for them to not really matter to us so much in ourselves? And what I mean is, when we look at that other person, we figure that they're human like us, they have weird thoughts, they have nasty impulses, they have biases, they arise, but they're regulated. Yeah. This is a reasonably regulated, civilized, person. That's what we really care about. We're all biased. 
We're all nasty. We all have swamp rats. Fine. Are they regulated in some reasonable way? Which includes recognizing them and accepting them and not shaming yourself for having them and appreciating that sometimes those swamp rats actually can serve some useful functions. That said, they're regulated. The key point is not so much the bias, it's whether it's regulated. And you can bring that same kind of looking at yourself to really ask yourself, yeah, you know, I have creepy thoughts. Yeah, nasty, weird little fantasies roll on by every so often. I got it. But do I let them hijack me? Do I let them, in the language of the Buddha, uh, do I let them invade the mind and remain? And if not, hey, it's okay. Everyone has a swamp and you can give yourself a pass and keep on going. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I, something I would like to kind of bring up here because it seems so natural and connected to what you're saying is are just like the ways in which we cling to our own painful past. Um, because like you're saying, we all have those swamp rats in the mind, they emerge. And I am often really struck by the things that people are unwilling to forgive themselves for. Things that they would forgive other people for without really thinking about it very long, very hard. I mean, of course, there are major trespasses that it is appropriate to take full and complete responsibility for, absolutely. But in general, I, I can't speak for anyone else, just myself, but I constantly replay these past moments that occurred in my life where I try to kind of like write a new script for this moment that I will never be able to relive. And like, oh, if I had just done it a little bit differently. And it's really remarkable if you think about it, what our brain moves to when we're not regulating it. And for me, absolutely, it is kind of chewing on these ancient events over and over again. And there are things where if I look at it objectively, I realize, wow, I would be so happy to forgive somebody else for this and not even forgive them. I wouldn't even necessarily think that it was that big a deal. But because it's inside of my movie and I have all the emotional tone around it, it is so hard to let it go. And that can really get in the way, I think, of self-liking. Because when you try to bring that liking tone to yourself, all of a sudden this other voice in the mind appears that's like, well, yeah, but remember that time. And man, I just think that that's a cycle that really pulls people into a lot of self-criticism. You made me think in a funny kind of way about evolution as a kind of arms race, sort of weird. What I mean by that is that we have these different capabilities and tendencies that evolve, and sometimes they develop before the regulatory compensatory element can evolve as well. So for example, in our hunter-gatherer bands, we definitely evolved the capacity for guilt and shame. That was very important because it helped to unify bands that needed desperately to work together uh, in extremely harsh conditions, including to come together against other bands that were attacking them or competing with them for scarce resources. So we have this capacity for shame and remorse that has flowered in us ahead of our capacities for self-forgiveness. Yeah, and that's why I think that one of the I guess it's a plug here of sorts. One of my favorite parts of the book we wrote together, Resilient, is the last chapter on generosity, which includes the generosity of forgiveness, including self-forgiveness. Great plug, Dad. Totally appreciate it. Thanks for doing it. I do love that book. It's on the shelf behind me if people can uh, see it if they're watching the video. We're approaching 100,000 copies. Sold, yeah, which is wild to it. think about. Yeah, yeah. they were 98, 99,000. Holy crap, you know, <laughs> wow. So thanks for mentioning it. And before we kind of go any further here, we've talked about this a bunch on the podcast in the past. So if you've heard us say this over and over again, you know, feel free to skip to the next timestamp if you'd like to. And by the way, I include timestamps in the description of all the episodes if you've never <laughs> noticed those in the past. Um, but a natural objection that arises whenever we talk about this stuff, whenever we talk about liking yourself or forgiving yourself or appreciating yourself as you are, you know, whatever it is, a natural objection comes up, which is this idea of the balance between liking ourselves versus pushing for more. And the objection goes something like this. Well, if I really move into liking myself, won't that just stop me from really trying to improve? 
or, oh, won't I like turn into a narcissist and no one will like me or something like that. And I would just like to kind of give you an opportunity here, dad, to respond to that very understandable critique that tends to come up. Classic critique, it really goes to two kinds of motivations. Are we drawn to the carrots or are we trying to move away from the sticks? And feeling that something is missing, something is lacking, or feeling that if you don't perform, you're in peril of punishment of one kind or another, that's being motivated by a stick. On the other hand, if you have a sense of capable, generative, contributing qualities in yourself that uh, are looking for ways to express themselves and offer their bounty into the world, then you're much more motivated by that carrot. It's important to appreciate that we can walk the same path. We can hold a job, we can raise a family, we can pursue a career, we can build a business, we can go to grad school and so on. Uh, based on either of those motivations, it's just that uh, being motivated by carrots is much more sustainable over the long haul. It's much more associated with peak performance over the marathon of a career. And whew, it's much less painful. It's much happier. So you can. Uh, appreciate that distinction. In terms of the service of that distinction, if you feel bad about yourself, well, you're being motivated by sticks. You're trying to avert experiences of shame, of worthlessness, or you're trying to um, you know, somehow do what you can to remedy that wound. On the other hand, if you feel pretty good about yourself, if you have a sense of what a sweet guy, what a good guy, what a decent fellow, tried hard, didn't quit, didn't give up, good on you. You know, not a hero, not, not world famous, not a saint, but still good on you. Um, to bring that benediction, that blessing to yourself, then you kind of want to help that person. You want to help that person manifest themselves in the world and you see the good in them that can come out in the world. And then inevitably, if there are setbacks or defeats, they're not so devastating. They don't immobilize and freeze you. You can dust yourself off much more readily because you have that underlying sense of your own goodness and capabilities. And then you can keep going. Yeah, I, I love that. And to kind of approach this question maybe a little differently than I've personally approached in the past, when we like ourselves when we're a friend to ourselves, when we're on the same team as ourselves, we naturally want what's best for us. You know, you, you want what's best for your friends because you like them. You want them to succeed. You want them to grow. You want them to change. Some Sometimes liking a person isn't just about, um, is, is, isn't just about hedonic values. It's not just about, I like them, so I want them to sit on the couch all day and play video games. It's like, no, I want them to actualize themselves in the world. And we can think about ourselves the same way, right? When I like myself, I want to actualize myself in the world. And that means taking action. That means changing in positive ways. That means not being a narcissist, you know, whatever you want. Um, and so I, I think that actually that fundamental liking, fundamental on the same sideness is, is totally foundational to any kind of lasting positive change. Truth. <laughs> Great, awesome. So I'd like to spend kind of the rest of our time here exploring some different ways that we can build that sense of liking ourselves up. Um, so dad, if you're comfortable uh, talking about it in maybe a slightly more personal way, I'm wondering for you, what supported you in liking yourself a little bit more? Well, so <laughs> it's so funny. I mean, as you become aware of yourself and, you know, I've, engaged this for quite some time, you do tune in to deeper layers in your psyche, including layers that feel very, very young. So there was from the beginning, and for whatever reasons, that basic sense of all rightness in my being that I that was there. And then layered on top of that, within a year or two or three, just the circumstances in which I grew up, which were decent and loving and stable, but still it contained a lot of low grade, but a lot of low grade emotional hassle and stress and weirdness. Uh, fairly soon, I got the sense of being beleaguered and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to make it better. I felt incapable. 
I was young. I was three years old. I was seven years old. And then I landed in school with the other kids and I really didn't know what to do with them. So I did not have a positive view of myself as a capable person. And I didn't feel very likable, which, and it's a short hop from that, from not feeling very likable to others to not liking yourself. So that was real. That was real in my journey. And then what I did, um, you know, kind of starting in college is I began to focus on this practice I've called taking in the good positive neuroplasticity, where I started to actually be honest with myself about this hole in my heart, and then deliberately began looking for evidence of worth, different kinds of things, evidence that people actually did like me, or evidence that I wasn't a total loser <laughs> interpersonally, or evidence that I was maybe kind of cute once in a while. And, mm. you know, I would look for evidence of all that, and bit by bit, drop by drop, fact by fact, I would then help that recognition of the evidence of my worth, my likability, uh, to kind of sink in. That was, that was a major, major path. And then very briefly, the other piece of it that has come in more in the last decade or so, later, later on, it's kind of has two parts to it. One part is the discerning of what are individual personality characteristics of different people and including oneself that are just kind of likable. <laughs> you know, they're, they're sort of funny or they're goofy or they're silly or they're unselfconscious or there's, there's something sweet about it or something charming or, or helpful or kind, creative, whatever it might be. Just those characteristics, those, those nuggets, I'll call them nuggets of, of, that are likable. Uh, likable nuggets inside us and to be more aware of them in myself and to kind of, you know, realize, oh, wow, I like that you know, <laughs> in myself. And that, that part's really important. And then last, just also in the last decade or so, especially, is focusing more on innate goodness, whether it becomes spiritual or whether we think of it in a secular sense, just that depth in every single one of us. And maybe this is kind of where my story began, my recognition of that quality early on in, in my own consciousness at the very, very heart of it all. Um, just the sense in, in ourselves and everyone that there's fundamental natural goodness, your deep nature, the ground of all, Buddha nature, the light of the divine within, or just you know natural goodness deep inside of us, that there is that inside you. And that mm. is very much worthy of liking. That's Thanks a beautiful for listening to that story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Really happy to. And I think that it's like there's so much in that that people can kind of take and unpack in their own lives that connects to this question of like, how can we be a better friend to ourselves and how can we like ourselves more? But I think that the that would really jumps out to me from all of that is just the idea of seeing clearly, like actually seeing the real world clearly not getting sucked in to the illusions that our mind kind of presents to us. And the more that we actually see clearly, no, I, I really was capable in these ways. No, I, I really am a likable person. And wow, no, I actually did pretty well that other time. Wow, all of a sudden it becomes so much easier to like ourselves if we just don't get sucked in to that hypercritical narrator that lives inside of most people. Um, That's really accurate. Yeah, it's like yeah. recognizing the good news. Yeah, absolutely. Like recognizing the good news when the channels are suffused with negative news. Um, to kind of answer this question a little bit for myself, I'm going to talk about two things. The first is kind of a, um, a tendency that I'm noticing. And then the second thing is uh, something that I'm working on more these days. And the first one is just this, you know, it's, a, it's a kind of an obvious idea. But like you were saying earlier, cultivating positive qualities that it's easy to be proud of is a really good way to start liking yourself more. And I noticed something the other day because I was thinking about this topic and I went, huh, as I've gotten better at stuff, for me personally, my sense of self-worth hasn't really changed that much. When I went from being a beginner uh, dancer to a more proficient dancer, my sense of self-worth didn't really change. Um, 
as I've gotten better at stuff in general, my sense of self-worth or self-evaluation hasn't really changed that much. But what really makes a difference is if I feel like I give a full effort. If I've tried hard, I feel really good about things, regardless of what the results of that effort are, really. Because I trust that if I try hard for long enough, things will kind of eventually work out. And the trying itself feels good. So for me, that um, that core virtue of just like effort out in the world is a huge resource for me around my own self-liking. When I feel like I worked hard during a day, I get to the end of it and I generally feel pretty darn good about myself. So that's kind of one category. And the other category that we've danced around a little bit is this idea of getting on our own side. Um, I mentioned it earlier, when you like yourself, you're kind of on your own team, you want yourself to grow and change over time. And I was realizing something the other day, and it was as I was laying in bed, kind of trying to go to sleep, and we all, you know, the brain starts to do what it does when you lay down to go to sleep, you're replaying the day, you're chewing on stuff, whatever it is. And I realized that most of the time when I laid down to go to bed, I had a kind of negative view on what had happened so far in the day. And what I mean by that is that my slant on it was like, ugh, you know, you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you could have done that better and you could have done that better. And then in kind of like the IFS model of different parts, that part was very present in my experience. And I realized that I didn't actually have a very rah-rah part that seemed to be naturally inside of me. I, I'm not somebody where I lay down to go to sleep and I have this voice inside of the head that goes, okay, Forrest, you know, you'll get them tomorrow. And hey, to you know, that's a new day. And from now on, you're going to do all of this different stuff. And so I just kind of had this reflection. I was like, oh, what would that be like? So I just tried to do it. I just tried to create that part inside of my brain. And all of a sudden, I started feeling a lot better. Huh, who knew, right? <laughs> oh, started, wow. Wow, strangely. I just felt- <laughs> Amazing. Wow, yeah, magic, <laughs> psychotherapy. Yeah, it's it's like, I started feeling a lot better. <laughs> and there's this kind of like energy and enthusiasm that can come from like a natural cultivation of positive parts inside of ourself. And I think that we can do that deliberately. Um, like, I think that we can actually cultivate that inner voice that is like, hey, you know, maybe today you didn't, you didn't exactly knock it out of the park, buddy, but you'll get them tomorrow, you know? And even that can so pull you into a sense of self-liking. So if you're listening to this, I would just like ask you that question. Do you have that natural part inside of yourself that is like actually fully on your team? And if you don't, well, what would it be like to cultivate that more inside of your experience like I'm trying on these days? Do you, I mean, I'm goofy about this, as you know, the inner caring committee and all that. If you were to imagine maybe figures from real life or from literature, movies and so forth, history, whatnot, who's on that team for you, Forrest? That, or who would you like to have on your team? Different types of people. Yeah, I think for me, it's it's interesting. It's often like friends. Also, I think mentor figures, like coach figures, I, I think can be really good for this. Not, you know, the brutal football coach that screamed at you during practice, but really somebody who's got that kind of more positively reinforcing quality. And I mean, you see that that archetype all over fiction, right? Everything, you know, Gandalf on up. Um, and I think that that's the character that I'm kind of trying to develop inside of myself more here. How about um, beings or characters who bring a kind of tenderness to you and are aware of your suffering and are letting you know that it's hard? And now what can you do next? I, I think these parts are like profoundly linked to each other. Again, to, to kind of lean on IFS a little bit here because it's a system I really enjoy. There's this idea in internal family systems. We had uh, Richard Schwartz on the podcast and I talked to him. It was a great conversation. And he did a little IFS therapy with me kind of live on the air, which was a radical experience for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, and uh, there's this idea, I think he actually had a book to this title along the lines of No Bad Parts. And the idea is that all of we emerge into the world with all of our parts kind of present in some way. 
And they all have natural roles that they're supposed to fulfill inside of ourselves. Um, but what happens is that life happens to us. And over time, our parts got kind of reassigned into more problematic roles, or they get kind of pushed away. And I think that for me, it makes me ask myself the question of like, huh, what happened to that rah-rah part? You know, what role is it fulfilling now when it's actually supposed to be doing this like positive rah-rah job? And to return to your question, I think that like my very youngest parts, my like most linked to, you know, an enthusiastic six-year-old are probably the ones that I feel the most connection to in terms of that like positive energy. Um, but they're also the parts that I think are the most like emotionally vulnerable, right? That are most desiring of that like intimacy and that emotional coddling and that, oh, it's going to be all right, you know, that very nurturing energy. So I actually think that there's like a real linking there um, between those different parts on my kind of little caring committee. And they're they're very inextricably kind of like bound up in each other. And I'm trying to figure out the the cosmology of how to make them all happy right now. So that's my own process I'm going through. Yeah, it's funny when I think back on times in my life when I've really had to dig deep and muster something to make a strong effort, which then later became the basis for liking myself in some particular way. So I, maybe it's just me, but I suspect it's not just me. It's often when I looked at something I was going to do and I was scared about it, or I was unsure about it, or I had made some early effort that flopped and I was coming back at it in some way. The person or the message that really catalyzed a breakthrough was usually very sweet, kind of tender. It wasn't a powerful, you can do it, be all you can be, you know, the theme song to Chariots of Fire swelling in the background. No, actually, it was always just about someone who clearly got it that mm -hmm. I was scared. Yeah. Got it that I, I felt weak or less than fully able or I was doubtful um, and could really register that and allow that to be named, to allow that to be named. And then in a sweet kind of caring way, also said, essentially, I think you can do it. I really do think you can do it. I th really think you can, Rick. And then kaboom. That, which it does not fit our script typically of how to be with someone who's really trying to do the best they can. But actually, it's interesting to appreciate that it's that way of being. So the takeaway, A, is to look for that way of being or include that way of being with yourself. And also to be prepared to drop into that way of being sometimes with other people who are themselves trying to dig deep and launch into a major accomplishment. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a that's a great point. This idea of the reciprocity of it, how we can be with other people the way that we would like to be with ourselves, how we can be more with ourselves the positive ways that we are with other people. Um, and it's just a great way to frame, I think, this whole territory. So we've kind of gone in a maybe a slightly different direction than I kind of thought we would when we first were talking about this conversation, but I really like where we've ended up. And um, it feels like it's gone in kind of a more experiential direction here. So if you're up for it, Dad, uh, I'd be super happy to have us do like a quick practice here related to being for yourself, which, as you said earlier, is something that we wrote about in Resilient. We have a variety of practices inside of the book. And uh, it's just like right in your wheelhouse. So I think that that would be really great if you're up for it. Oh, that's great. Well, maybe what I'll do is name um, three things. Uh, as a practice, and it'll be kind of quick. And if you're listening, uh, <laughs> best not to operate any heavy equipment <laughs> while you're doing <laughs> this. <laughs> okay. And maybe not if you're driving, but you know. Yeah. So first is think about how you are with another person when you're on their side. You're for them. 
you maybe see room for improvement in them. You're not turning a blind eye, but you're an ally to them. So you bring to mind someone that you're that way with. Maybe a word like loyalty is there for you. You're loyal to them. You support them. And then just to name three aspects of that, to kind of call them out, in your stance toward the other person are, are probably some cognitive aspects in which you have a general standard of decency or respect for them. And you have a sense that they deserve decent treatment just like anybody else. They deserve fairness, they deserve justice, they deserve decency. You know, you have like a principled attitude toward them. Also, you probably have compassion for them. You have empathy for the ways that life is landing on them. It's hard, it's challenging, it's tiring, it's painful, it's stressful. You have and and you're moved with heartfelt, warm feelings toward them. Compassion. And then there's this element that's kind of muscular where you're going to deliver the goods for them. You're on, you're on their side. You're going to come through. You're going to help them move. You're going to go with them to the doctor's meeting. You're going to listen to them when there are things that, you know, are bothering them on the phone. You're muscular. Okay. Now for yourself, same thing. Can you look at yourself as someone like any other human who deserves decency and fairness, including in the accurate appraisal of yourself. Seeing yourself accurately and holding yourself to the same standards that you hold other people to. No less, but no more. Principled attitude. Like, I, I deserve a good life. I deserve to be supported. It's okay to support me. I'm not taking from others by supporting me. I need to fill up my own cup. I need to put my own oxygen mask on. Can you have that attitude? Also, can you have compassion for yourself? Can you recognize how things are hard for you? Doesn't mean wallowing in self-pity. And on the basis of that, have like a sense of your own pain and a feeling of support for yourself. Ouch, this hurts, that you want to relieve the pain. You want to re help yourself feel less anxious, less, less irritated, less frustrated, less beleaguered, less unfulfilled. You want to, you want to help yourself you know, emotionally. And then third, can there be this muscular sense of determination? of moxie for yourself that says, no, I'm not going to put up with that stuff anymore. Or yes, I've got to say things, even though they're scary for me. Or I need to assert myself with my boss, my partner, even though I'm scared. And I'm going to stand for myself. I'm going to stand with myself. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to be strong on my own behalf. Can you mobilize that as well? So these are three qualities. You can feel them right now as I talk. You can definitely develop them. First, a kind of morally principled view about yourself that it's okay to seek the good for yourself. Uh, second, a quality of compassion for how things are hard and difficult for you. And third, this muscular feeling that you're gonna be strong on your own behalf. That's what it means to be on your own side. That was great, Dad. Yeah, thank you so much for doing that. I, I hope that people found it really helpful. I know that it's something that, you know, it, it, it's funny, people ask me about this sometimes. They're like, what's it like to have your dad be Rick? And I'm like, well, it's probably about like it is to have your dad be anyone, right? It's a, it's a different <laughs> relationship, but you know, I, I don't, I don't have to have a relationship with like you, the the therapist or the public figure in the same way that other people do. I have a relationship with you, my dad, who happens to be these other things. But this is one practice that I know has definitely been like useful for me personally in terms of uh, not always necessarily having that natural orientation of like really being on my own side and really, like I was saying, have that kind of like fundamentally supportive part 
So developing that has been really useful for me personally. And I can say that if you're listening and you feel like you also don't have that particularly part very present inside of you, doing practices like this can be really helpful to develop it. Mm, Thank you. Yeah, so today we had a wonderful time talking about liking ourselves more and getting on our own side. We began today's conversation by talking about where this lack of liking ourselves comes from, and Rick had a lot of different ideas. Some of it comes from a clear recognition on some level of the things that we've done in the past that have been a bit problematic. Some of it comes from social comparison, the ways that we might compare the fullness of our experience to the highlight reels of other people. And then some of it comes from a kind of imbalance that naturally arises inside of our experience, where we habituate to our positive qualities, but get sensitized to our negative ones. Whatever the source, it's an incredibly common problem for people to struggle with feeling like they just don't like themselves that much. A key component that both Rick and I emphasized early on is the importance of forgiveness. Recognizing the painful aspects of our past is an important part of developing in ways that put us in a better position in the future. Yes, absolutely. And at the same time, we don't want to cling to those painful moments past their expiration date. It can be helpful to have a moment where we recognize all of the many things that we've forgiven other people for. The passes we've given them, the things that we've been willing to kind of sweep under the rug, just the general stuff that comes up inside of our important relationships with other people where we go, you know what? Yeah, that bothered me, but man, it's time to move on. And then think about that directed towards ourselves. What are the things that we're still beating ourselves up about that just aren't really serving us anymore? We're not getting any positive growth out of it. It's just causing us more pain. Then we had a brief conversation about some of the value that can be found in really liking yourself, beyond, of course, the pleasurable experience of liking yourself. A common critique of positive psychology that you might hear yourself is that if people really like themselves, if they really get into the way that they are right now, well, won't that just stop them from changing in positive ways? Or at worst, won't it kind of turn them into a narcissist? But the truth is that nine times out of 10, if not 99 times out of 100, that's really not what happens. When you like somebody else, you want what's best for them. You want them to have a great life, for things to turn out well, and more importantly, you want them to kind of actualize themselves. You want them to be all that they can be. And the very same thing is true for us. When we like ourselves, we want what's best for ourselves, and most of the time, That's not just being lazy and sitting on the couch. It's finding out who we are out in the world and doing the best that we can. So liking ourselves naturally contributes to a stance of personal development. It doesn't like hold it back. From there, we talked about some different ways that people can tune into that feeling of liking themselves and some practices they might take on that could help them like themselves a little bit more. What really stood out to me and what Rick was saying was the importance of seeing the truth clearly. The negativity bias of the brain makes it really challenging a lot of the time to get in touch with our positive qualities and our positive aspects. While, again, as I said earlier, it is very easy for us to see the aspects of ourselves that we aren't as in love with. And as Rick expressed regarding his own personal journey, as he was able to see those good qualities more clearly, to see the ways that he actually was an effective, positive, you know, good-natured person out in the world, the more in touch with those qualities he became, and the more he started to like himself as time went on. For my part, I emphasize the virtue of effort, where, man, end of the day, if I feel like I've done what I could, I tend to like myself a lot more. I tend to feel a lot better about myself. It's not so much about what comes of that effort. As I've improved my skills, My self-worth hasn't always changed alongside that improvement. But at the end of the day, if I can earnestly say that I feel like I've done the best that I could, it becomes a lot easier to like myself. Then we talked for a while about essentially getting on your own side and cultivating parts of yourself, your caring committee, as Rick likes to refer to it. These kind of positive inner voices inside of all of us that can support us toward positive ends. 
And I offered this reflection that I had found that I didn't really have a kind of very positively focused on the future part of myself, a real optimist inside of me that kind of drove me forward with some good positive reinforcement. And that I've been really trying to cultivate that part more recently, and it's been really helpful. Then finally, we closed with Rick offering a practice of being for yourself, getting on your own side, seeing your own positive qualities clearly, and externalizing parts of the process, viewing yourself as if you would a friend from the outside rather than kind of from the inside of your own experience. So if you've been enjoying the podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you would take a moment to subscribe to it through the platform of your choice, maybe even leave a rating or a positive review for the podcast. That does tend to really help us out. And also you can tell a friend about it. It's probably the best way we have to reach new people. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for just a couple dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a bunch of bonuses in return. That's it for today's episode. Until next time, thanks for listening.